Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today, we're sitting in Mama Chang Restaurant in Fairfax, Virginia, one of my favorite restaurants of all time anywhere. And we are here with Fuchsia Dunlop. Now, Fuchsia is the only individual we have done three conversations with Tyler with, and that should tell you everything. Fuchsia quite simply writes the best books. I don't mean the best books on Chinese food, I mean the best books. And there is a new one, Invitation to a Banquet, the story of Chinese food, which is just out. Fuchsia, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you, Tyler. Great to be back. Let's just start with very quick introductions of everyone at the table going around this way. Lydia? Hi, everyone. I'm Lydia. I am the business owner. This is my family business. And welcome, everyone, to Mama Chan. Hi, my name's Fergus. Um, I work on the Fitzwilliam, an online publication of Irish ideas. Uh, I'm Sam, I'm an economics undergrad, and uh, I work on the Fitzwilliam with Fergus. I am Rashid, and I help Tyler at Mercatus with the Emerge Adventures. I'm Dian Wong, I've spent the last six years in China, now I'm at the Yale Law School as a visiting scholar. Very simple question to start for Fuchsia. How is real soy sauce better than what we might buy in the store? <laughs> Well, I guess naturally fermented artisanal soy sauce has a kind of tang to it and a richness, which would be uh, much more impressive than your average sort of mass manufactured soy sauce, if you're lucky enough to get some. And how many different soy sauces do you either make or own? Oh, I, I don't make them, but I have, I don't have that many actually, a select them. few, you know, there are other decisions to make when cooking, apart from, you know, choose between 50 soy sauces. <laughs> And where in China has the best soy sauce, or your favorite, in your opinion? Well, Fujian is supposed to be best for artisanal soy sauce. Um, but I suppose um, there's an amazing, really traditional soy sauce factory in Hejiang in southern Sichuan. And it's this magical place on the banks of the river with all these clay um, pots, tanza, with straw hats covering them when it rains, laid out um, with sort of traditional buildings. And they do traditional, old-fashioned, no you know, modern innovation soy sauce. And a combination of the flavor and the place is just exceptional. Now, many of your books, they're cookbooks, they're history books, they're also a kind of cultural studies set of books. But your latest book, again, Invitation to a Banquet, it is primarily a history, right? It's not a recipes book. So after having gone through so much history of Chinese food, what updates have you made or what have you changed your mind about? What do you now see differently? Well, I suppose the, the striking thing about um, Chinese culinary history is that there are these extraordinary continuities going back thousands of years in some cases, like steaming, for example, since the Neolithic age, or making fermented soybean products going back more than 2,000 years. Um, but that it's also always been so multicultural and so sort of innovative. Like, you know, the Han Dynasty about 2,000 years ago was a period when lots of new ingredients and technology actually critically for milling flour from wheat, which brought noodles and so on to China, but came in. And I think while researching this book, it was just a real reminder of how receptive Chinese food has been to other influences and how it's a kind of composite of, of many different places and ideas. So we're here in 2023. You've been to China recently. You went all over. Perhaps you had a few meals. Uh, during pandemic times, it was hard to get there. Over those years, what has changed or what has struck you as different? Well, so going back, the first thing that was really striking, there were many fewer foreigners. Um, so, you know, when I was there in the 90s, there weren't many foreigners at all. And um, I felt very conspicuous. And then there's been a period with loads of expats and visitors and tourists. And sort of in the wake of the pandemic, again, I was feeling like I was the only foreigner around. And food wise, um, well, one thing that I found hilarious and surprising was having takeouts delivered to a hotel room by robots. So that's never happened to me here. So technological advances. And then also everyone I met was talking about yu zhi cai, like semi-prepared dishes. And um, so it's been a real trend in China that, um, that restaurants are having central kitchens that are supplying dishes that are either fully made and just need reheating or partially made to be finished in a restaurant. And, um, and it seems to be a really hot topic of conversation. And of course, all these concerns about sort of the, the erosion of culinary skills if chefs are not learning to cook from scratch, but are just finishing dishes. I have more questions, but now we turn to Lydia to tell us what just arrived. 
Right, so welcome to Mama Chan, and today we're having a banquet meal, so invitation to a banquet. Uh, we typically like to start our banquet meal with something cold, a cold platter. And today we have a um, platter of four different kinds. We have the fava beans with goji berry. We have the braised shiitake mushroom. Uh, we have some tofu skin and mala beef jerky. Yusha, are, are Chinese eating habits individualizing? So we're here together as a group. We're going to share a lot of dishes. It's how it should be done. But as you know, birth rates are declining. More people in many countries spend more time alone. That makes it harder to have that kind of meal. How is that evolving in China? Well, I think it's very noticeable that restaurants in cities, um, there are more restaurants with small tables designed for couples and smaller groups. Um, and um, yeah, so, um, but, but I mean, you still have the kind of round table, big gang, but uh, also alternatives. I have more questions, but let me now turn to Dan Wang to my left, who will ask a question or two. Um, Fuchsia, in your book, you quote Darren Adria as saying, who is the most uh, important culinary figure of the last 50 years? Well, surely it is uh, Mao Zedong because the chairman sent all of China's farmers uh, and all of China's chefs to work in factories, um, thus destroying the preeminence of Chinese cuisine. Um, is he right? How much do we really understand what culinary culture was between, um, you know, before the People's Republic? And can we recover a lot of those traditions now? It, I mean, one of the reasons that I wrote this book is that it seems to me extraordinary that China has this exceptional cuisine, which is so diverse and sophisticated, and also which resonates with so many contemporary concerns. And, you know, there are parallels in China of going back to the 10th century of people making imitation meats from plant foods. You have this tremendously creative, transformational cuisine which echoes the avant-garde cooking of modernist chefs in the West. All this stuff, and yet China has been a sort of terra incognita for many people in the food world. And this is, I think it's purely historical reasons. Um, so, you know, the, the, the Chinese food that most people in the West know stems from American Chinese food, which, which was created by immigrants from one particular region, the Cantonese South, who were working in very different, difficult circumstances. You know, they were facing racial prejudice. They probably didn't have access to all the ingredients that they were used to. And they were often cooking for people who had no acquaintance with, with Chinese food. So you have this simplified, very appealing, fantastically popular and successful, but not really a good representation of this amazing culinary nation. So, um, yeah, I think, um, and then throughout the 20th century, war revolution, cultural revolution. And so China was just, you know, not part of international culinary exchanges. And I think also prestige food is often about money. You know, Japan got rich first. Japanese food is very prestigious. People will spend loads of money on, on Japanese sushi, but not so much on Chinese food. So I think that, um, yeah, Farhan Adria is right that um, Chinese food doesn't have the recognition, the acknowledgement that it really should have. And um, yeah, and I think now it's possible, really. <laughs> You know, to have a fresh look. Can we um, cook a 10th century meal from Hangzhou today, or is that mostly lost to us? Well, the frustrating thing is that there are um, some, there's an amazing source, um, well, actually, of sort of, what is it, 12th, 13th century Hangzhou, um, describing all the food served in city restaurants, and it is dizzying. You know, there were all different kinds of restaurants, regional Buddhist vegetarian restaurants, restaurants for students, and snack shops of different kinds. And the author um, lists all these delicacies, but there are no recipes or descriptions. <laughs> so, um, so there's tantalizingly not very complete information. But you could, you know, I know chefs, I know a chef in Hangzhou, actually, who has created banquets of Song Dynasty food as far as possible from the texts. So I think we have to partly use imagination and, but some, you know, there are some, con you know, continuities in ingredients and techniques, so. Fuchsia, we'll give you a moment to eat. So I'll ask you, Dan, a question. Much of pandemic you spent in China, some of that in Yunnan. What did you learn about Yunnanese food during those months? 
I wonder whether Yunnanese food uh, can be considered a cuisine uh, as such. I think it is uh, mostly not a very uh, convenient label. So uh, Yunnan is a uh, very mountainous region that is historic Tibet in the north, and that is um, close to being culturally Thailand, Cambodia, um, uh, Myanmar uh, in the south, uh, where it borders. Um, and so, you know, how do we um, make sense of a cuisine that is basically Tibet in the north and Thailand in the south? I don't really think that there's such a thing as possible, that it is such a mountainous zone, uh, you know, splintered by, uh, you know, perplexed with intricacies. Um, and so, you know, I think this is mostly mountain food, depends on where you go. I don't think we can recognize it as a coherent cuisine as such. A question for Rashid. We'll get back to Fuchsia in a moment. But you're from Barbados. <clears throat> Chinese food is different in every country, every region. How is Chinese food different in the Caribbean? Chinese food in Barbados is actually quite dull, unfortunately. However, in Panama, <clears throat> which I also live, Chinese food is probably as exuberant as you would go in some parts of China. There are parts of Panama, where if you, El Dorado area, where dim sum is, the Chinese restaurants are packed. They are full, not only with local Chinese, but also other Panamanian races. And it's just like a very big aspect of culture. And to me also, Chinese food in Panama has a much more authentic flavor than even most parts of Europe if I had Chinese food. And that's, uh, I think, quite surprising, almost like a hidden secret in Central America. And do you have a question for Fuchsia? Yes. So recently, given the often the surprising boom of Sichuan food globally even, there's been a movement by some elements of the government, for example, to publish these Sichuan requirements. I'm curious how that has impacted some of the culinary styles in Sichuan. Well, yeah, so as you said, there's been a sort of bid to standardize and categorize classic dishes. So, you know, the local government, also in Chongqing, Chongqing, they've produced publications which say this is mapo dofu and this is the ingredients. Um, like having a sort of, you know, appellation, appellation contrôlée for wine or something. Um, but I think the point is that, I mean, it's an interesting and noble endeavour, but people cook in a much more free, ad hoc, creative way. So there are many different ways to actually make a mapo dofu, maybe some key characteristics, but you don't have every chef measuring to the gram the amount of minced beef or the amount of Sichuan pepper. Um, so I think, I, I would say they're not having that much influence. And also because um, Sichuanese cuisine, one of the great things about it is that it's so dynamic. I mean, people in Sichuan love eating and they're creative and they're always, you know, doing things like making Sichuanese dishes with okra, which was not around when I was a student there in the 90s. So I think that um, there's always this tension between, you know, we all feel nostalgic and we love tradition. And there's something worthwhile about trying to document classics and traditions. But at the same time, you have to recognize that a cuisine is a very vital living form of culture, which is recreated in every kitchen every day. So um, yeah, so the difference between practice and theory is quite, you know, quite deep. Do you have observations on what we're eating so far? Mm, well, it's certainly <clears throat> delicious. Um, and it's lovely to have um, some vegetable dishes. And that's one of the things that um, Chinese food in the West, with the sort of concentration on shrimp and chicken and you know, beef and fried foods and so on. But actually, the glory of Chinese cooking is that there are so many vegetables. It's healthy and balanced and refreshing. So you might have a rich, intense dish like this mala beef, numbing and hot beef very delicious and rich and meaty, but also we've got this lovely tofu skin with a sort of very light dressing and a bit of crab meat yes. and some very refreshing shiitake mushrooms. And this is gorgeous, yeah. these um, white beans with laozao, fermented glutinous rice wine. So, and these are all quite unusual to have in an American Chinese restaurant, I would say. For a typical quality Chinese meal, let's say in the United States or maybe London, what percent of the credit should go to the chefs? And what percent of the credit should go to the people who bought the ingredients? How do you think about that? <laughs> you're, you're quoting Yuan Mei, the great 18th century Chinese gourmet. <clears throat> well, that's another thing that's really interesting because um, I think Chinese food in the West is not associated with premium ingredients. 
So if you go to a sort of fancy Spanish restaurant, they'll be trumpeting their Iberican ham, so on and so on. If you go to a new Californian restaurant, they'll be talking about which farm they got the produce from. But Chinese restaurants generally don't say much about the ingredients. And that's just because they've been kind of stuck in this bracket where people don't go to Chinese restaurants for fine ingredients, which is completely mad. And you know, in this book, there's a whole chapter about this, really, that the Chinese practically invented the concept of terroir, you know, the obsession with seasons, with provenance. You know, exactly you know, which land your, um, your vegetables are produced on in and so on. In traditional Chinese cookery, certainly a vitally important part of it is sourcing seasonal, fresh, quality ingredients. Um, so it would be nice to recognize that. And this is clearly happening here. We've got all these uh, you know, Amish farm ingredients, right. right? Yes. I would say it comes maybe in <laughs> both ways. We appreciate and we use a lot of local ingredients from um, the Maryland crab that paired with our tofu skin. We also go out of our way trying to look for seasonal, like really good quality uh, white beans. Um, what we are about to have, we have some Amish pork dumplings. Uh, we try to source the uh, um, best ingredients, uh, the whatever we can find, and use it uh, to make quality dishes. And I think uh, my feeling is that you know if. <laughs> Chinese cuisine in the future, in contemporary times, manages to unite the exceptional culinary skills of Chinese chefs with the old obsession with ingredients. They're just going to blow everyone else away. Uh, Fusha, sorry. <laughs> Fusha, you mentioned the, the terroir concept, but for example, there's a very uh, big, it's a very high-end tea, for example, and they focus a lot on the terroir aspect. I wonder how much of that is a quality difference, or is it really like a big chunk of marketing itself? <sighs> well, it's, I mean, it's like wine, isn't it? It's exactly the same. So I think that, um, you know, to an extent, um, probably there is, uh, you know, that the exact, the, the soil and the weather in a particular place will influence an ingredient. But clearly, there's also a sort of cultural and imaginative aspect. And so there's a lot of fakery as well. So people pretending that they're supplying Longjing tea from, from the <coughs> Longjing hills around Hangzhou when it's not actually that. But probably people who drink it still feel that it's finer because <laughs> of the label. Sam, do you have a question for Fuchsia? Yeah. Um, so I went to India for the first time uh, over the summer. And uh, the food was wonderful. Um, but it sort of struck me that it was Indian food had transferred with relatively high fidelity to like very high-end Indian restaurants in Glasgow or Birmingham and so on. Uh, nothing in the cuisine was sort of shocking to me uh, in a way that I suspect it, it would be traveling around different areas of China. So, I mean, you mentioned um, Chinese food in the West being so Cantonese, but is there kind of more to it than that or like more factors that determine um, which cuisines translate with higher fidelity? Yeah, so, so the first thing is that China is absolutely vast and it has a very stunning diversity of different terrains and climates um, with all the implications for produce. So there are so many ingredients from different places. Um, so you're only ever going to see uh, small snapshots of this great richness of Chinese cuisine abroad. So even though now we're beginning to see um, you know, Sichuanese food and different regional cuisines, there is so much more. I mean, I've been researching this for about 30 years and I'm still discovering entire new styles, you know, local traditions practically every time I go to China. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, um, um, and in terms of fidelity, I think Chinese food, I, I said in the book, it's a kind of victim of its own success. Um, and it's all about timing. So Chinese was one of the earliest immigrant cu cuisines at a time when Western palates were probably more conservative and it was you know, more difficult to try and faithfully reproduce Chinese food abroad. And it got stuck, public perceptions of Chinese food have got stuck there. But now things are changing and there are so many immigrants, students, visitors from other parts of China living in you know, cities like this and all over the place um, who want to eat proper Chinese food. They want to eat the food they eat at home, whether it's from their hometowns or it's trendy cuisines like Sichuanese. So it's now possible for Chinese restaurants in the West to, you know, they don't have to tailor to Western taste. They can just start off doing food for a Chinese clientele. So then it's more faithful. One should also say that 
some of the, I mean, like your Yunnan cuisine, for example, the, the, the marvellous thing about Yunnan cuisine is all this local produce. There are so many ingredients that you simply can't find anywhere else in China, let alone abroad. And so it's harder to, I mean, you can't really reproduce many aspects of Yunnan cuisine, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's right. Um, if I can ask a follow-up question on um, this comparison between India and China, you know, maybe this is half a question also for Tyler. Um, why do we associate uh, Indian cuisine so much more with long simmers, uh, whereas Chinese cuisine, um, of course, it is a little bit of everything, as Fuchsia uh, knows so well, but it is often a little bit more associated with quick fries. You know, what is the factor endowment here of you know, these two very big uh, countries, very big civilizations, having somewhat divergent paths, as we imagine, with culinary traditions? <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Um, and it's, it's hard to answer because I don't really know anything about Indian food. Um, I did have a really interesting conversation with an Indian um, who came on my tour to Yunnan earlier this year. Um, because I was kind of speculating that one of the reasons that Chinese food is so diverse is that the Chinese are really open-minded with very few taboos. So apart from, you know, Muslims eating halal food and some Buddhists not eating meat, um, there's a kind of great adventurous open-mindedness to eating. Whereas in India, you have lots of taboos and sort of religious and ritual restrictions. And, you know, and that's one reason that you would think it would be a constraint on the creativity of Indian food. But um, this Indian I was talking to, who's a food specialist, he reckoned that the restrictions actually forced people to be more creative. So he was arguing that Indian food was, you know, um, had all the conditions for diversity that Chinese does. But in terms of cooking methods, um, it's hard to say, and I, again, I don't know about Indian food, but the thing about China is that there's been this, this intense thoughtfulness about food, really, f for, for a very long time. I mean, you know, you see it in descriptions of food from 2,000 years ago and more. Yeah. And then in the Song Dynasty, this incredible restaurant, restaurant um, industry in places like Hangzhou and innovation and creativity. And um, so I suppose that when you are thoroughly interested in food like the Chinese and thinking about it creatively all the time, you, you end up having a whole plethora of different cooking methods. Um, and that's one of the striking things about Chinese cuisine, right? That you have slow cooked stews and simmered things and steamed things and also stir frying. So that might explain why, um, you know, several different methods are, have achieved prominence. Before I comment on that, Lydia, on the new dish, please tell us. Oh, we're, what we, apparently it's an empty plate now. Uh, <laughs> we have a vegetarian spring roll. So spring roll is something that we love to have as a holiday special. We have it over spring, um, the Lunar New Year, or, you know, it's actually, um, you wrap things together. Um, sometimes you add shrimp, pork, um, and for this one, we use vegetarian, and that's a really amazing vegetarian dish. Mm. On your India-China question, this is pure speculation, but my sense has been China was wealthier earlier for a longer period of time, and on average stayed wealthier, so it had more in the way of meats. And you had people eating in large groups, so the idea that you would chop up the meat and divide the meat and feed it to people, and then flash stir-fry the meat in some way, India, it's more likely you're cooking vegetables, you're on various spice trails to a greater degree. Uh, the Indian spices work very well being simmered for a long period of time. You're less concerned with, well, how am I going to cook this meat? Because Hindus are not eating beef, and it seems that pigs are much harder to raise in India than in China. That would be my guess, but do you have a take? I have no take. <laughs> okay. But I, another idea that I was thinking of was that also, and I, again, I don't know about India, but China very early on, like in the Song Dynasty from about 12th century, had a really lively and developed and diverse restaurant scene with restaurants at different levels. And so eating out was a real thing. And I should imagine it, with eating out, that, and, and there were restaurants with menus where you would order your dishes, you know, um, not just um, fixed menus and so on. And so in those conditions, you do want dishes that can be made quickly to order. So maybe that would encourage the development of fast cooking methods as well as, you know, um, home cooking and, you know, slow the, the pot on the stove in the home kitchen. What about 一趟地三鲜? 
so the hot food would um, beat three times over the flavors or uh, Chinese people love to eat hot, hot, quick hot food. Yeah. Well, I suppose, so, and, and also, Greater urbanization but actually China, another right? thing, and, and is the, the emphasis on texture, and I don't really know about the history of this, but mm. one of the really distinctive things about, um, about Chinese gastronomy is that the Chinese totally appreciate and understand texture to a degree that is unheard of anywhere else, really, and that's why they enjoy eating so many slithery, rubbery, and also often tasteless foods that have interesting textures. And there are certain textures, so for example, one of my sort of old favorite Sichuanese dish, Huo Bao Yao Hua, fire exploded kidney flowers. So that's made with pork kidneys, which are cut into little frilly pieces and stir fried very fast. And you actually have to cook them fast to keep them nun and a little bit sort of crisp, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think um, perhaps when people have this obsession with texture, there are certain ingredients that require fast cooking. Also vegetables, right? So that you don't have everything very soft, but you have this briskness, liveliness, crispness in the bite. But what's your speculation on why this kogan is such a big feature of the Chinese food? Okay, speculation again. <laughs> but I mean, but I think the thing about um, China, you know, like there was this ancient philosopher Gaozi who said, um, food and sex are human nature. And there's this, unabashed pleasure in the physicality of eating. Like English people traditionally are a bit sort of buttoned up and you know it's impolite to make noises when you eat and it's not very proper to show too much exuberant delight in food, right? But in China you see this absolute joy in eating, in ancient poetry, <laughs> in the way people eat today. Yeah. And, and I think part of that is, is feeling uninhibited about it as something physical. So like when you eat in China, you can make little noises, you can, you can put something like a duck's tongue that's grappleless and a bit bony and complicated to your lips and you can enjoy the, the game with your teeth and tongue. And that's all perfectly acceptable and enjoyed. Perhaps when you don't mind a little noise and you, you're not shy of the physicality, then you can have things that are slithery and crunchy and um, you know, require a bit of engagement when you eat them. Really makes you wonder about the English approach to sex. <laughs> yes, well, let's pass swiftly on this subject. <laughs> Lydia, please tell us about the new dish. Oh, we're having a ginseng soup uh, with what looks like tofu, but it's actually chicken. And this is a classic Sichuan banquet dish, which goes back at least 100 years. It's sort of written about in a very famous text, early 20th century. And it's just a reminder that Sichuan food is not all spicy. You know, like any other Chinese cuisine, it's about balance. So if you have very, you know, intensely flavored and hot dishes and oily dishes, you always have refreshing like things like this lovely broth. And this is Amish chicken, right? Why That's is that? Right. How and why is that different and better? Well, let's just say that the environment has a lot to do with um, how things are raised. And you know, it's when dad first met the Amish community, he felt a strong tie to the way we live. It reminded him a lot of the time, you know, he was um, raised as a boy in the village in China in the 60s. Uh, my grandmother was a farmer. Um, she used to be the one that's earning all the credits and contribute that to the local, the village government. And in return, they don't really have a lot um, to eat on the table. So it's uh, the humble life of the Amish community reminded that a lot of uh, nostalgia. Sam, do you have another question? Well, I was gonna say, um, Tyler recently told me that the third best chicken he ever had was an Amish chicken, which <laughs> pleased, pleased me a lot because it Im implies you have an encyclopedic ranking of every chicken you've eaten. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, to continue on the tra train of uh, extremely speculative things, um, there's this uh, famous or perhaps infamous observation about how um, whether areas of China uh, engaged in mostly wheat-based or mostly rice-based agriculture has effects centuries later on you know, various so social outcomes, SAT scores, et cetera. Um, and you know, thinking about Ireland, where I'm from, even just beyond the famine, like it seems like there are many ways in which the presence of the potato, like, and the dominance of it, like, affects culture and land holdings and so on. Um, how do you like think about the role of the staple crop in creating like the culture or cuisine of a certain place? Hmm. Well, 
An easy question. <laughs> <laughs> and you thought I asked hard ones. <laughs> well, I suppose, I mean, the, China was a whole civilization that grew around the staple grain, which was originally millet, and all the rituals of the state, the ancient Chinese state, were about offering food to gods and ancestors, um, so wheat and alcohol, and um, sorry, so millet and alcohol and so on, and mm. roasted meats. And um, yeah, I mean, I suppose what's interesting about that is that millet went on being the sacred grain right up until the end of you know, the, the Chinese imperial period in about 19, 1911. Um, but it had actually disappeared from people's daily diets. So people in North China went on to eat wheat and noodles and breads, but millet remained the staple grain. But um, yeah, so I guess there's a, a gulf between what people are actually eating and ideas about ritual and so on. What remains of Manchu cooking in Chinese food today? Well, um, I mean, there's a bit in the book about this idea that, I mean, one of the distinctive things about Chinese cooking, going back about 2,000 years, is the habit of cutting food into small pieces and eating it with chopsticks. And yet, there are some dishes which are presented whole, like a um, you know, Cantonese ceremonial suckling pig or Peking duck. And of course, they're cut up before they're served because you don't have knives at the Chinese dinner table. But um, the Manchus were sort of rugged northern nomads who liked um, eating huge chunks of sheep meat, um, which they would then cut apart with their own personal knives. And this was something that was still part of um, high-level um, society in the Qing dynasty when China was ruled by Manchus. And you can see these little eating sets that people slung onto their belts or tucked into their boots where you have a pair of chopsticks and a knife so that people could eat both Chinese and Manchu food. The, the sort of whole roast meats, particularly in northern cuisine, may have been a legacy of this Manchu predilection for meat. And there's a scholar, Isaac Yue, who I cited in the book who looked at an 18th century Chinese banquet menu and there were whole servings of what were clearly Chinese dishes with food cut up very fine and served in, in soups and stews and then these whole services of real sort of you know charred and roasted and boiled meats which were Manchu so um, and then also actually in, in Beijing cuisine there is some legacy of the Manchus in dairy foods so like sort of other nomads, they ate um, dairy foods. And so you have very fascinating something in Beijing imperial cuisine called nai lao, junket, which is like a steamed custody dessert <laughs> made from milk. Um, and also another very interesting dish where nai lao gan, when it's cooked at a very low heat, that it turns to a kind of fudge, a bit like dolce de leche, but um, solid. So there are traces of Manchu food in Chinese cooking, particularly in the north. Lydia, what is new on the table, please? It's our homemade uh, pork dumpling, and we use uh, Amish pork. Uh, now maybe you can tell me what the difference is. <laughs> Fuchsia, why doesn't <clears throat> pork in particular have a higher status in China? Because why Chinese it? eat so much of it. It's maybe the best pork in the world, right? <laughs> the best pork dishes, but it's not the highest status food or, or close to it. Well, because it's popular and ubiquitous, and um, so uh, pork is the celebratory food for anyone traditionally, but in China if you want to get to the really highest echelons of gastronomy you need rare and exotic and particular and sought after foods. So things like deer tendons, you know, these are imperial delicacies, camel's hump, you know, um, hashma, the ovarian fat of the snow frog, all these unusual delicacies and bird's nest, rare and fabulously expensive. So. These things are more prestigious in China, in China because they're scarce and expensive and extreme luxuries. Does bear's paw actually taste good? Yeah. Um, you better ask someone else. <laughs> <laughs> because you've never had it. Yeah, you don't have bear's paw really served these days. It, was, it, was in, it appears in, in um, cookbooks right until the 1980s, you know, even of state banquets. But, um, you know, it's now something. But you have lots of bears in America, don't you? We do, but I don't think you're allowed to eat bear's paw. I'm not sure. Can't you I've eat? never tried it. <laughs> It seems awkward to eat, at the very least, right? <laughs> well, but I mean, if you're Chinese, that's no problem. Because, you know, um, people in China eat camel's feet and pig's feet, and they cook them to make the most of these gristly and gelatinous textures. So the fact that it's um, highly grappless and not appealing to a Western palate is no problem at all. Fergus, do you have questions? 
Yeah, so as we sort of alluded to earlier, there's this uh, regional divide in China where in the north, um, you know, wheat is sort of primarily grown rather than rice, um, which is obviously much the same as, as Europe. So what is the kind of explanatory factor that, that means that in China um, people tend to make noodles rather than bread? And obviously bread in Europe rather than noodles. Is there a kind of factor, a single factor that explains that? So it seems that um, the chi this is, um, there's a very interesting book, The Cultural History of Chopsticks by Edward Q. Wang, who looks a bit at this. But it seems that the Chinese very early on, apart from eating um, food that was cut into small pieces, they really liked eating food that was plucked out of um, hot liquid, right? And so the classic ancient Chinese dish, long before stir fries and the more, more sort of famous modern Chinese dishes, was the gung, which was a sort of soupy stew made from lots of ingredients that were cut into small pieces floating around together in liquid. Um, and of course, this sort of evolved with the use of chopsticks, which are very suited for eating that kind of dish. And um, so it seems like some you know, early forms of pasta appear to have been, you know, bits of dough dropped into hot liquid. And that would have fitted in to the China, you know, a way of eating that was already becoming, you know, a bit distinctively Chinese, you could say. And so, um, and I think that's still the case that, wouldn't you say, Lydia, that Chinese people really like liquids in their food more than Westerners. So uh, a classic Chinese, you know, in England, we say meat and two veg is like a basic standard meal. In Chinese, it's si cai tang four dishes and a soup. And when I was living in Sichuan, you know, you never have a meal without soup. It might be really, really basic, but it's just going to be a light broth to cleanse the palate and sort of, you know, refresh you after the other dishes. So I think perhaps, you know, and in modern China, you know, Westerners much prefer chow mein, stir-fried noodles. Chinese is all soupy noodles, and fried noodles are much, much less common, really. So perhaps this is what, why. And also just in China, um, until very recently, and still in most cases, Chinese people don't have ovens at home. They do not um, roast or bake. So everything was done on a stovetop, a design that really hadn't changed much for 2,000 years. <laughs> you know, so you, have, um, you can still see in farmhouses in China these stoves with two openings for woks or steamers, and that's how you cook. And so bread in China traditionally is usually steamed and sometimes cooked on a kind of griddle, maybe with a lid, like Xiaobing. Um, but um, yeah, the absence of ovens as a common kitchen implement and the love of hot liquid. Now, you, you live in London. If I'm looking for good Chinese food in London, conceptually, how should I go about it? Should I run to Chinatown? Should I go to the outer boroughs? Or what's the right schema, apart from any <laughs> particular place you might recommend? Well, I mean, I would look at where um, Chinese students are eating, partly. So then you'll get the sort of more recent um, trends in China. But how do I find that out? If I just ask ChatGPT, will it tell me where the Chinese students are eating? Or? No, you need someone, um, someone who reads Chinese to go on social media and find whatever, what is being talked about, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that would help. <laughs> Maybe the app Xiaohongshu is going to help. Xiaohongshu, <laughs> uh, yes, it's popular true. popular among yeah. Yeah. students. Mm. Uh, Fusha, how, how much cumin is too much for a Dongbei barbecue? I, I mean, that's a matter of taste, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Yes. Uh, have, you been, have you been assaulted by excessive amounts of cumin then? Or? <laughs> to me, it varies so much because sometimes I eat cumin is like the it's just cumin flamed, essentially. Yes. And then sometimes it's none, none at all. And I ask people, you know, how do you determine? And they say, well, guess taste, but it feels like I felt with something more than just, I decide today to put more cumin than not. Than not. Right. It's very unstandard in that sense. Hmm. Yes, I have no idea, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, a follow-up question. Um, so a very standard Caribbean dish is jerk chicken. Yes. And a very strong component of that is soy sauce. Mm -hmm. And people don't always consider it as a Chinese influence, but of course it is. And I'm curious if you, is there any other areas of standard dishes across the world where it has a very strong Chinese influence, people don't really realize it itself? Well, that's hard to say. I mean, I suppose that, I mean, all soy products is, you know, the influence of China, right? Because China domesticated the soybean very early on and soy, soy foods have been incredibly important. Also in, you know, they came to Japan from China, right? Making tofu and soy sauce. So, um, 
Wouldn't Mexican really. mole be an example? Those original Puebla recipes from the 17th century? What came on the galleon from right, the Philippines, from Manila, a lot of yeah. Chinese influence oh, really? ingredients. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have been told, okay. speculatively. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I'm trying to think of examples. Yeah, I'm really not sure. If a reader is using their recipe, your recipes and they make a mistake, what's the most likely mistake for them to make? <laughs> I mean, um, not, not paying attention to cutting things evenly with stir-fried food, maybe. And how does that influence the final taste, or what goes wrong then? Well, it's just, if you're stir-frying something that's cut into um, slivers or slices, the whole point of stir-frying is meant to be very fast, and the reason that it's effective is that um, if the food is cut finely and evenly, then everything will be perfectly done at the same moment. And if the cutting is clunky and uneven, then some pieces of food will be overcooked while others are still raw. So I think that's maybe something that people don't necessarily realize that it's not just aesthetically important, it's also technically important in Chinese well, food. Why might an older Chinese chef be reluctant to stir fry himself or herself? Oh, well that's, um, yeah, because, um, and this is something that several people have told me, that stir frying is perhaps the most difficult of all cooking methods in any cuisine because it's so fast. Um, there's no room for maneuver, there's no margin for error. So if you have food that's finely cut and that is sensitive to heat, so like, I don't know, stir-fried scallops, for example. Mm. Um, so if you overcook them, it's a complete disaster. So you have to cook very quickly and you have to add your seasonings absolutely correctly because you can't, it's not like making a hollandaise sauce when you can have a taste and then add a bit more lemon juice or whatever. You have to just have this instinct. So it's like wushu, it's like martial arts. You have to be on the top of your game and it's incredible seeing, you know, when you see a really accomplished chef with a professional cooker stir frying, it is so fast and it's so instinctive, there's no measured thought, they're just doing it correctly. And it's a kind of miracle when it turns out right. And yes, I found that sometimes when chefs have been ex explaining even their own personal classic dishes to me, their preferred method is to stand by the wok and get a younger apprentice to cook. And people have said that's because, you know, the elder chefs have more a management role, they're not cooking every day. So like a martial artist or a dancer, they're not, they don't have that fluidity and sharp instinct that you have when you're doing it constantly. So you may eat your dumpling. I have a question for Dan. Dan, you're a Canadian citizen. You've also spent plenty of time in China. How is Chinese food different in the United States versus Canada? I think Canada depends on where you go, um, but where I grew up in Ottawa, um, there wasn't a terribly great amount of Chinese cuisine. And I think the, there was a little bit more of the Cantonese influence. Um, you know, something like 11% uh, of Canadians live abroad. Uh, and that was, uh, that's, I believe that is the highest ratio in the world. And that is because uh, in about, you know, in the 90s, the Canadian government just offered extraordinary numbers of visas to Hong Kongers to uh, basically escape Hong Kong before the, uh, you know, you, before their return to the mainland. And so that has a very big uh, Cantonese influence. Um, now, I haven't really tested this, but people would say that Vancouver at some points had you know, the best Chinese food in the world um, because of just the amount of um, influx there, uh, but I haven't really tasted enough in Vancouver to say. I've only been there three times. My sense was they had first-rate Cantonese food, not quite as good as Hong Kong, but you know, clearly the best in this hemisphere. But in the other areas, at least at the time, they were much weaker. Right. Fergus and or Sam, do you have comments on Chinese food in Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, or anywhere else you've been? Yeah, I mean, I suppose Chinese food in Ireland is similarly not very developed, like in uh, Barbados. Um, if there is any um, sort of non-generic uh, Chinese restaurant um, in Ireland, it's probably Szechuan. Uh, so I'm interested, like, how did Szechuan become maybe this is not an accurate description, the like prestige cuisine, uh, like the one if a first regional Chinese restaurant opens in a city, it's most likely to be that one. How did that happen? Well, I think that Sichuanese food travels really well. So there are some cuisines like the food of the Jiangnan region, or Yunnan, we already said. There, there are so many really unique local ingredients that you can't get elsewhere. And when you think about Yunnan food, you think about these extraordinary ingredients. But Sichuan food, the heart and soul of Sichuanese cooking is in the, the artful combination of flavors. 
So not just ma la, numbing and hot, but also yu xiang, which is, you know, a bit of sweet and sour, pickled chili, ginger, garlic, spring onion. All these wonderful um, <laughs> um, combinations of flavors. And I think that if you have, because the sort of identity of Sichuanese food is in the, the flavors, you can apply a Sichuanese yu xiang fish fragrant sauce to the kind of fish that you can get in um, that you can get say in England it doesn't have to be a local carp it'll still feel like Sichuanese cooking because the flavorings and the techniques are there so I think that with you know a Sichuanese cook just needs a sort of small battery of key ingredients Sichuan pepper dried chilies pickled chilies doubanjang pickled chili paste soy sauce vinegar and then you can cook whatever's to hand so I think for that reason it's quite accessible and transportable as a sort of concept and a practice. Olivia, could you speak to the new dish, please? Absolutely. So we have a seafood stew with crispy rice. And this is one of the typical dish that you think, oh, it's um, you have a rice crispy on the top and cook everything so fast. But I would probably call this one of the gong fu cai because we homemade the fish ball. And that process on its own is probably eight to 10 hours. Um, and you know, you see some jumbo shrimp in there, scallops, um, and they're all cooked at different time for it to be at perfect condition. <laughs> and what region is that from? Uh, well, this is something my dad is, holds very dear to his heart. Um, the fish ball, we eat it back at home in Hubei. Um, yeah, this is a, I would call this a Hubei cai. And how do you think about not just any single dish, but how you put this meal together? the combination of dishes, what, what would you tell us? Well, I have to say, um, if you go to any Chinese restaurant, um, it would tap probably takes um, a mastermind to put a <laughs> banquet menu like this. Um, so either someone that's really knowledgeable in the ingredients, in the methods that are, things are prepared, um, you get a good balance of something uh, mild, something with soup, something crispy, different poetry. It, it's really like putting puzzles together. And um, Chinese people eat pretty picky. So any end of the meal, I'm sure the guests will have something to say, oh, I didn't like this and that paired together. So it really takes a lot of skill to put a banquet menu on the table. <laughs> so today's meal, uh, Chef Peter, my dad actually put everything. Great, Fergus, comment or question? Yeah, going back to the sort of exotic ingredients aspect, so I think we even mentioned, um, say, deer tendons earlier. In, in the West, at least, it's um, deer are typically wild. It's quite difficult to domesticate and farm them. Um, so what does the kind of economy of accessing those ingredients in, in China look like? Presumably, some are intensively farmed if possible, but presumably others are very difficult to get your hands on. Well, they're quite unusual. And some of them are imported as well, and uh, some of them are wild. And then, of course, you know, one of the problems that China has is also with an illegal trade in wildlife. But that's under the table, and um, you know, that's um, not in the open, so you're unlikely to find these things on sale in markets. Um, but um, yeah, most people would never eat any wild food because it's expensive and scarce. Um, and yeah, so I'm, you know, when I was saying about things like um, the deer tendons, I mean, that's a grand old imperial delicacy and not something common at all. And then some ingredients are imported. So like, um, well, bird's nest is farmed. A lot of it's farmed in Malaysia, right? So. Well, when I go to China, sometimes I'm disappointed when I see so many hot pot restaurants. They're mm. typically pretty good, but they're a bit all the same. And maybe I'll, I'll go, eat there once during a trip, but after that, it's just a kind of plague. What's your view on this? Why is this happening? I totally agree with you, and I call it the hot potization of the Chinese <laughs> restaurant scene. And it's just, you know, hot pot is great fun. It's a really convivial, lively, inexpensive, it can be very inexpensive way to eat and, you know, to, to share food with your friends. But in terms of cooking technique, it's definitely low skilled. So, and that of course makes it hugely appealing for restaurateurs. I mean, you know how difficult it is to get good chefs, right? Walk chefs especially, it's a nightmare um, because it's so difficult to do. Um, with hot pot, you just need a good soup base. You can even buy it in 
and then you just need staff to slice up bits of food and your customers cook it themselves. <laughs> and so I think it's partly that Hot Pot is very popular and partly for economic reasons that it's actually just a lot easier from the point of view of the restaurateur, right? But yeah, I'd support, particularly with Sichuan, I mean, Sichuan has such amazingly diverse and exciting food and Hot Pot is a poor reflection of all that. And may I add, I think hot pot restaurants are like the McDonald's in China. <laughs> <laughs> it's really considered as a um, fast food restaurant. Really. Yeah, well, like, a lot of them are, but they, you also have incredibly high-end ones true. with, you know, seafood and incredible. Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of, you find them at all levels of the market, but it is a bit of a plague. Nice in moderation. By the way, I have to say, this, the technique of this dish is fantastic. And you, Explain, if you notice, please. Well, so you've got an assembly of all different ingredients, and as you said, they're cooked separately. So these fish balls have a lovely, light, delicate texture, but they're not, flat, they're not completely flaccid, they have a bit of liveliness to them, a bit of scallop in mine, sort of juiciness. The prawn is beautifully silky and also a bit crisp, and you have the vegetables that are crisp and not overcooked. So that shows you that they've all been cooked separately to the peak then combined together, and then you have the lovely contrast between the crisp crunch of the, um, the guo ba, the rice crust, and the liquid. And so there's a lot that has gone into that, technically, right. right? Lydia, the, <coughs> the new dish, please explain. <coughs> Excuse me. It, it and tell us like what's the difference <laughs> between chicken of this sort, on the bone and not on the bone. This is not chicken. We're having scallops oh. today. Oh, okay. So yeah. we elevated right. it. Um, uh, yes, you are right. Typically, we would serve this as la zi red chili pepper chicken. And some people would like to call it um, the treasure chicken because you have to find the chicken among a pile of red peppers. Um, mm. And to elevate it, um, today we're eating wild scallops. That and has also, a good heat to it. It's rather lovely. Do you see the garnish? These very deftly, intricately cut cucumbers. And that's something that you hardly see these days. So it's a real sort of classic old school Chinese cooking, but it's labor intensive. Um, most people, did your father do it himself? Or one of he chefs? did it himself. And let me say about 40 years ago, um, he was actually in a national competition to just um, uh, to compete on the knife cutting skill. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, apart from the technical aspects of cutting, like you have to cut, I mean, the practical aspects, you have to cut to eat with chopsticks, the technical ones, evenness for stir frying. There's also mm. the aesthetic um, aspects. And there's this whole other thing, like the French sugar art <laughs> of completely frivolous artistry with vegetable cutting. Dan, do you have a view on hot pot? Um, I, I think it's terrible. The, <laughs> what, what, what else is there to say? I think that uh, hot pot is a great social activity, um, but it is uh, never really my first choice to eat. But on the point about chains, uh, one of the uh, things I've observed over the last few years is that there has been a pretty uh, growing uh, uh, scale of chain restaurants featuring basically slow, casual cuisine. I'm thinking about uh, Xibei noodles. I'm thinking about the sauerkraut fish restaurant that is re achieving remarkable consistency uh, across uh, all of these different restaurants, which is a pretty difficult thing to do, I understand. And I wonder, you know, do you see that these restaurants can be something like Ding Tai Fung to become, you know, major exports um, at some point? Or do you think that will be, they can't quite figure out the international market? Um, well, I don't see why not. I think they'd be very popular if they could export. And I think that this sort of technical innovation in Chinese food is something there's going to be more and more of. Like we mentioned, you know, the pre-prepared dishes, which is something that is not necessarily a good thing. But, um, but also, yeah, I met a, a very high-level chef in Beijing who was showing me um, a, a robo-walk, you know, a, an electric walk that was trying to automate the process of stir-frying. Um, which I'm, I'm sure is at the early stages. But yeah, I think if they can achieve the consistency and standardiz standardization, which they are doing in China, then yes. Um, but one thing about Xibei particularly, this is a noodle, um, a restaurant that specializes in Northwestern um, sort of country cooking, right? And in particular, oat pasta, which is a specialty of Shanxi province. And when Xibei opened the first branches in Beijing, they had all these people on tables outside doing incredible, it's a bit hard to describe, but they, 
They have a big lump of oat pasta in their hand with a little bit going between their fingers and they rub it onto the board and they get a tongue of pasta on the board. They whip it up into a tube and they stick it in a steamer and you end up with all these tubes of pasta together in a steamer like a honeycomb and then you steam them. But I have to say that when I've been recently, they don't have those people anymore. Mm. So I don't know whether they're dropping the real artisanal high skilled aspects so that they can standardize and expand it but that's a bit of a shame because it was lovely when it started that they were showcasing one of the amazing sort of handcrafting noodle arts of Shanxi. Mm. Are the fuchsia or Dan, do you have an opinion on how good the Michelin guide is for China and I guess Shanghai in particular might be where you would use it? Do you want to go first? I guess I would have never tried to look at the Michelin guide that's anywhere right? yeah, in uh, China. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I guess I would look a little bit more just at the apps and look at the photos. Is Michelin Guide useful for you? Well, I think they do identify some of the very best restaurants in Shanghai, in Chengdu. And, and it's helpful for people who don't know Chinese to have some kind of guide. Um, but the downside is that I think although, I mean, the classic Michelin methodology is to send a single inspector to a restaurant to have a meal. And that means that um, eating like this, which is more typical of many very excellent Chinese restaurants, is a little impractical. I did interview someone from Michelin re recently, and they said that on occasion they do allow inspectors to go out in groups. Which, But certainly with the early Michelin Guide to Shanghai, for example, they did pick lots of excellent restaurants, but they missed some that were equally good, but that did not have tasting menus suitable for individual diners. And I'm guessing that may be partly why. Places where you have to book a private room and have a big dinner. Um, so I would say it's, um, that's one issue with it. But they have got better also at recognizing even small noodle shops in Chengdu. And I think they're trying to be closer to the pulse of what people actually want to eat. But the downside is that I know um, a lot of Chinese chefs I know are a little bit preoccupied with Michelin. And I think that when, and it's the problem in the West too, but when people start aiming at Michelin stars, then it has certain implications for Chinese cuisine, like a sort of pushing people towards individual plating rather than this style, which there's nothing wrong with, but the, this is lovely eating like this too. So I sort of hope that it doesn't sort of distort the way that Chinese chefs are actually cooking and presenting their food. How are social media changing Chinese food? In the US, people Instagram their food, I would say far too often. So there's an incentive to create Instagrammable dishes. To What's totally, going on in China? Totally Thank in China. I mean, everyone's on their phones like maniacs, like people everywhere else. <laughs> and um, yes, and certainly um, very visually exciting food. And that's one problem actually with Sichuanese food, that I think it's the real drama dishes, like, you know, this sort of lads of chicken normally, which are great, but they're just one facet of a very diverse cuisine. And um, again, I think maybe they encourage restaurants, not just in China, but everywhere. But it's the same pressures of social media and... Um, yeah. <laughs> one Podcasts. Point. And it brings people in, but when they're in the restaurant, I guess it's a whole menu dictates um, if we can keep them. A lot of the time, restaurants suffer with, oh, we have a lot of one-time diner. Mm. They can, yeah. because of Instagram, the food is Instagrammable, but actually it doesn't taste uh, amazing. So what is the reason for them to come back that goes beyond social media? What is the new dish? Oh. <laughs> It looks like we have a uh, young, uh, so in Chinese, umami has half fish and has half lamb. So this is a dish with full umami with our fish ball and lamb stew. Lovely. I heard about that as a Shanghai dish. And when I first heard about lamb and fish stew, I did not quite believe it as a real <laughs> soup. Have you been converted? I, I have been converted. I think it's awesome. <laughs> Maybe you should go, go first? Okay, yes, yeah. please. And also, again, we were talking about the importance of soup. This is a proper Chinese meal with Absolutely. a soup. <laughs> it's not just one soup, it's courses of soups. Right, and a nice soupy dish here. Sorry, Tyler. Where in China have you not eaten the food? I have never been to Jiangxi province. Mm -hmm. Also, one place I really want to go is Heilongjiang in the Dongbei, northeast, because there it's sort of bordering Russia. 
and that's going to be a whole other, um, you know, lot of local ingredients and traditions and a bit of Russian influence. It's a very good restaurant in Dulhua, right on the border of North Korea, that has a very, very strong North Korean Chinese cuisine combination. And it's the only place you can go to get that particular food. Yeah. I mean, that's, the, again, the diversity of Chinese cuisine, that you don't only have the sort of branches of classical Chinese gastronomy, but also you said in Yunnan, you have food that is like Vietnamese, Thai, Laotian, and then in the Northeast, Korean, Russian. I mean, it's really very extraordinary. Mongolian. Yeah. Chen Yang, I quite like the food. Spicier than I was expecting it to be. Right. Wonderful dumplings. Hmm. Maybe the best dumplings I've had in China. Oh yeah, there are there are kind of Shenyang dumpling restaurants on there in other yeah, places yeah. too. Yeah. Since uh, Korea was mentioned, my uh, Korean friend has a um, theory that a lot of, um, or p perhaps most of, uh, sort of global variation in cuisine can just be explained by temperature in different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, that you know, Western and Northern Europe, it's too cold to cook outdoors, and if you're cooking indoors and you don't want to poison yourself from the fumes or the smoke, uh, you have to rely a lot more on covered pots and um, cooking vessels that rely on less, that, that create kind of less smoky, uh, f flavorful dishes. Um, what ca yeah, how, how do you kind of think about the um, geography or temperature of a place as, as a variable? I was just trying to think sort of, so Chinese wok cooking does create a lot of smoke and so on, but I mean, in lots of, Chinese modern apartments, they would have a kitchen that's almost like a balcony that where you can open all the windows so you don't actually influence the place where people are sitting and eating, but it's adjacent, right? But I suppose in, yeah, in, in the north, Dongbei north, you have lots of hearty stews and soups. So maybe to an extent, very interesting question. The Sichuanese say they need to eat a lot of spicy foods because it's such a humid and hot environment. I've never understood that. What, what, what actually, why is that helping with <laughs> the it, humid it environment? Because it makes you sweat. So you have to, because it's humid, you have this unhealthy dampness in your body. So you have to have ginger, chilies, Peppercorn. peppercorns to make you sweat. Um, and that drives out the, um, the unhealthy humidity and restores a lovely equilibrium. Yeah. But I mean, the funny thing about that that, I, that is a little inconsistent is that the Cantonese South is also pretty humid, it seems to me, and yet chilies are not advised there to, <laughs> for eating. But sweet water is. Tangshui. Oh, yes, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Yes, you do other things for the. This is a lovely texture, too, with the, the sort of slithery, crisp woody mushrooms. Yes, as well. Good. You've noted very well, Fuchsia, that um, Chinese cuisine has bit of an elitist bias. These eight great, great cuisines are very much concentrated in the more rich uh, coastal uh, provinces. Um, I wonder, can you gesture towards what a people's history of Chinese cuisine <laughs> could look like? You know, what, how do we actually incorporate these folk traditions a little bit better into our conception of Chinese food so it is not so Cantonese and Jiangnan focused? Well, I think, so the first thing to say is the eight great cuisines is a very recent scheme. You know, people talk about it as if it was something really old, but I think it only, I've said in my book, but I think it only goes back to about 1980 or something. And um, so there are many different ways of trying to express the regional diversity of Chinese food, all of them totally inadequate because it's such a sort of intricate patchwork. But, but I think already, as you said, Jiangnan, which is the food of the eastern sort of region around Shanghai, very elitist. Fine Cantonese food is very elitist, but Sichuanese already has a reputation for being a sort of hearty folk cuisine, right? So it is represented. The, the eight great cuisines, um, incorporates like Anhui, which is not regarded as a very great culinary region now. And I think it's, the, the categorization of that scheme is actually quite irrelevant and it doesn't, rep I think if people took a fresh look at it, they would include, um, and also in the eight great cuisines, Hunan cuisine is one of them, but that they're talking about elitist Hunan food and not the wonderful spicy home cooking. So. I mean, I think in terms of what people actually want to eat, it's not elitist, right? So the cuisines mm. that are most popular now, Sichuan, 
what else? Hunan, no. The spicy ones are more spicy popular. Spicy ones, yeah. yeah, Guizhou is also, and that's not an elitist cuisine. So um, I think that, you know, the people writing about food are no longer the sort of Confucian gentleman scholars, are they? So it's, uh, yeah. Why is Hunan food fallen behind in the West? So you used to have so many restaurants that claimed to be Sichuan, Hunan. You know, they weren't really either one, but nominally there was some connection. And now pe many more people want real Chinese food. There's plenty of more or less broadly authentic Sichuan places, but I, I don't see broadly authentic Hunan places. What happened? Not so many. Um, I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Um, my understanding was that Hunan food became quite popular after Nixon's visit to China, and you know, this was all Chairman Mao. And then everybody just started advertising their um, Chinese restaurants as uh, Hunanese cuisine. I think that kind of um, shaped, distorted our view. And so maybe people have caught on. Um, personally, I enjoy Hunan food a little bit less than Sichuan food. I find Hunan food a little bit too oily. Um, and it, the flavors are a little bit too much instead of more refined and tingling and um, teasing in the way that Sichuan often is. Liddy, do you have a view on this? Um, Are you well, tempted to serve Hunan dishes? <laughs> yes. May I introduce you what we're having? Mm -hmm. This is a Sam special, uh, <laughs> but it's not fair to serve it only to Sam. That's why <laughs> our table gets a separate platter. This is um, Chef Peter's signature uh, dish. It's a dry fried eggplant. Um, mm -hmm. He has done so many ingredients the dry fried way. We call him a dry fried master. He can do it with fish, he can do it with shrimp, with okra, with cauliflower, with shiitake mushroom. It's the special batter that he coat anything with, makes it very crispy outside, but still like juicy and tender in, inside with um, great balance of cilantro, Sichuan pepper. Sometimes he likes to add cumin, other times it's um, just a lot of flavors. If you think about all the family Empire. How many restaurants is it now? I stopped counting. <laughs> Stop counting, exactly. <laughs> Obviously the food is wonderful, but in terms of business principles, what has made the difference? What have you all done that has been the difference maker? Viewing them as commercial enterprises. All right, I have to start with the things that we have tried, but uh, not in a way financially successful. It's mm. we keep trying to uh, offer new concepts. We wanted to, in a way, offer modernized Chinese cuisine. You know, people will call that more fusion or not really as authentic. This is something I really want to ask the people sitting on the dining table. So when it comes to, comes to the tradition, the classics, the authenticity versus modern ambience, what is the balance? What is your ratio when it comes to like, if I'm going to pick a place for a meal, what do you guys look for? The floor is open. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm a very usual diner. So I don't care that much for ambiance. Usually I like a very dull place. Cause oftentimes, especially with the, I, I, I love Filipino food also. And because it's usually a very demure location, just go in, everyone's, it's like a family restaurant. So they cook everything very simple, homemade, done. And you go in, they don't have time for the other aspects of it. But I know, when you go to those kind of places, the only other people there are just other Filipinos. And similarly, because right now I live, in, I live in Madrid, and oftentimes the best Chinese restaurants I find, actually mostly Hunanese actually, are just very simple restaurants. And that's usually where the most people from Hunan typically go and have food. But the ones that look very nice, very objective sense, typically cater to just the average consumer. And because of that, they don't really tend to put that much effort on the food. But, you know, that's, uh, most people I think would prefer a nice looking restaurant. I am uh, against nice looking restaurants <laughs> because it attracts too much Instagramming. Yeah. Um, I'm there for the food and we, we're there for the food. Um, you know, we don't want the photos. Well, one of, one of the uh, key tenets in the uh, Tyler Cowan theory of how to select a restaurant is uh, looking for spelling mistakes on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, thank you. Uh, yeah, similarly, I think um, some combination of um, Chinese clientele, not a particularly nice venue, and uh, I think just kind of 
I guess also when you're in a restaurant, typically if in, in the UK, if the service is kind of not as warm and I guess um, polite. You, you, you as like to be expect. treated mean. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's usually a very strong signal about the food being good, and I find that to be very true. I don't think you should take any of this advice. By <laughs> exactly. So this is a constant debate. Well, I mean, Fuchsia will probably. Uh, uh, what, what do you look for? Do you look for the a dining room full of at least ninety percent Chinese audience? Well, I think having a Chinese audience is a good sign. Um, but I like everything, and I sometimes I like to go to beautiful places with amazing service and beautiful china and elegant presentation. And sometimes I like to go and have street food. And that's the joy of eating and of Chinese food, that you have something at every level. Yeah. yeah, and I think also just this thing about classics versus innovation. You know, all the classics are actually the product of innovation. Somebody was saying to me the other day, you know, mapo dofu, it's only 100 years old. You know, it's not an ancient dish. The Sichuanese didn't have chilies until a couple of hundred years ago. And um, so I think you, you know, you can't be too conservative, really. I like it when the diners are grumpy. When they're too happy, I start to get suspicious. Like, why are they here? Are they here to have a good time? There's something about food. You mentioned sex earlier. When you film people doing it, they don't necessarily look happy. Wow. So it's true. I shouldn't take any of this advice for <laughs> Fuchsia's, who is maybe closer to our day-to-day -day customer. Um, it, it is absolutely true when it comes to a business success is we look at what brings people back. So yes, you can have a very peacocky, showy um, dish that maybe lights up in flame or you know, something that people look at it, they're like, wow, I want to see what they're really like. But once they are in the door, um, you know, we think about what makes them stay. It really goes down to the ingredients, the, their personal feelings. You know, some of you guys like to be treated in a mean way. Maybe that's a strong <laughs> association <laughs> with um, uh, how you are being, being treated. But I believe um, there is a lot of perception about Chinese cuisine. We're trying to make a change too. And again, I know that everyone on this table is a um, foodie and takes a lot of pride on standard and quality. Uh, we're trying to expand that audience. We want anyone that doesn't know much about Chinese cooking coming to a restaurant uh, and feel good about being here. It's not just them, it's everyone they're eating it with. Yes, our dining room is a little loud, uh, but we tend to you know, offer them appetizers before the entree comes out. Um, and we offer them a little like um, matcha or um, ice cream at the end of the meal, kind of in a way feel them, make them feel comfortable and familiar with what they're eating. Um, otherwise, you know, we stay pretty true on the flavors. We like to offer bold flavors, especially how Dad started his career in the US. is really not afraid of using peppercorn. At the time, it was banned in the US. Um, there's no legal way of getting peppercorn or source it. Uh, I remember the restaurant owner would ask um, their family member in China to send it over from Fujian. Um, so yes, things have changed quite a lot in the past 20, 30 years. And now we're looking at, oh, there's a lot of options. What is, from a business per perspective, what makes us different that we get a customer to come back for occasion, special celebration, or for the, their day-to-day -day carry out and delivery? Tell us about the new dish, and should one eat it with chopsticks? <laughs> Everyone should eat with chopsticks. <laughs> yes, we have a pork belly dish that is um, from start marinated and then coated with rice flour. Um, after it's steamed and cooked 80-90%, then we want it to create a crispy texture. That's when we start to put in the wok very quick um, double side uh, pan sear, and then uh, add all the green jalapeno, the scallion, the red chili pepper, uh, peppercorns. This is my favorite dish so far, <laughs> this and the numbing beef. But Fuchsia, would you comment on this? I was just thinking, this is the first time, I mean, so do this thing when you marinate the pork belly and you coat it in rice crumbs and you steam it, is a very classic Chinese country dish. And it's the first time I've had it fried like this, and it's delicious. It's a sort of, um, like a, a new version of pork or roll, back yes. in the pork, pork yes. twice cooked pork. Um, if I can ask, um, 
This is a dish that is very known in the household family when you have um, something steamed. Like at home, my mom or my grandma will steam it for the first time and serve it as a beautiful first time dish. But for something to be consumed later in the day or the next day, um, people tend to get tired of eating the same thing over and over. So they get really smart on why don't we pan sear it so it becomes a new dish. Mm, we're gonna have to try it. Yeah. Lydia, are you um, seeing a difference between Chinese restaurants in the DC area, in the LA area, and the New York area? Is there a distinct difference with these things, or they're just kind of you know Sichuan restaurants or something in, in each of these places that are kind of consistent? I feel like um, restaurants or restaurant owners um, are very smart to see what the trend is. Uh, as you guys can probably see, Sichuan restaurant, you know, if we're talking about in the 2000, there has, there has not been many. Um, and that's probably how that got his reputation on um, being a master Sichuan chef. Although he's really a classic trained Chinese chef cooking all um, the regional cuisines. Uh, I want to say ever started in the 2010-ish. Um, this is when the new immigration from China started to merging. A lot of them went to LA, a lot, of them, a lot of them went to New York, a lot of them came to DC. So we're starting to see um, Najia in Orange County. We see um, Zhili, which is a very um, Jiangsu Zhejiang Cai in New York. Um, and I'm just naming uh, a few, there's actually a lot more regional cuisine. Like some, um, I remember my friend, uh, Chef Simone Tong, was making Yunnan noodles by NYU, and it's vastly popular. Mm -hmm. Sam, any comment on the eggplant? It's very good. <laughs> Fergus Rashid, what's been your favorite dish so far? Ooh, um, the eggplant has been very good, actually. Um, I've also liked the, the scallions have been excellent. I think I'll go with the pork. This one, this my one, favorite, yes. yeah, why? I usually like a very subtle ma tingling sensation. Usually that's not kind of overpowering. And also the combination with the, the fry is very, very good. If you had to pick a favorite so far, do you have a nomination? Well, so for me, I love the pork and I love that soup with the fish balls. And, but for me, the reason this is such a lovely meal is that it's such a well-planned menu. And this is the thing that I think foreigners have the most difficulty with with Chinese food is how to assemble a menu. And you've really thought about different cooking methods, different ingredients, textures, some wet, some dry. And that's what makes it not only delicious, but also shufu, comfortable, because we have this, you know, something very sizzly and then a lovely, light, refreshing soup. So the pleasure of the meal is sort of physical as well as just, I mean, yeah. And how did you learn say. that? Just by induction? You were served a lot of meals and you ran the mental regressions? Yes. Or is there a way it can be taught to someone like you? Well, mainly I've learned through just constant eating. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I mean, I try to write about this really. And the idea that, you know, a well-planned Chinese menu it's not just about delicious tastes. And I think if you think about going out for a classic French meal, you think about having lots of rich food, pudding, cheese, and feeling quite heavy afterwards. With a well-planned Chinese meal, you can have dozens of dishes and still feel comfortable. But I think it's just, you know, as a foreigner, once you start considering that the, the light and delicate dishes are just as important as the razzle-dazzle exciting dishes, then you're on the way to be able to plan a nice meal, right? I would say start with picking out your favorite and look at, oh, what am I missing from there? And that's a good way to go. And your father taught you? I guess so. I am very influenced by both uh, great chefs at home, mom and dad. Mom is a pastry chef, dad is a uh, walk chef, and I, they train me to have a very uh, picky palate. Mm -hmm. But I think also it's just, yeah, it's about not repetition, right? That's the key thing. So if you have a dish with one ingredient or one style, you just want to make sure the other ones are as contrasting as possible. On yeah. the subject of Fuchsia's writing, I think that your book is wonderfully well organized um, to have 30, to introduce the cuisine through 30 dishes and to use that to talk about knife work and the diversity and everything else. I thought it worked really well. 
And furthermore, what worked well was that you are just a fabulous writer in terms of making the physicality of eating uh, very, very good. Can you speak a little bit about, you know, is food writing, this is, um, I think it really rewards um, food, really rewards good writing. Can you talk about how you learn that other craft that you've picked up so well? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I don't know how, I mean, it's just <laughs> instinct and trying to, I mean, I suppose what I've been trying to do all this time is find ways of describing the intricacies of Chinese food um, to make it sort of illuminating and delightful for people who didn't grow up with it. And so trying to find ways, things like texture, which is a quite difficult subject in the sense that many of our texture words in English are a bit disgusting, slimy, grisly, but trying to write sort of playfully and engagingly so that people can both sort of acknowledge these unfamiliar textures, but also see how they might be delicious. I did a degree in English literature, so I read lots of good books, which is the best training for any writer. But I think also I just try to have fun with it, um, you know, to just be playful and have a laugh. And also I just, I love eating. And I have, since I was a teenager, I've always kept a journal and it's always turned into sort of epic descriptions of <laughs> meals. So I've had a lot of practice. When you worked for BBC World Service, you learned how to write then or before? Or? Well, I mean, I suppose I've always written, I mean, you know, I had a certain training for, for how to think about language and try to, trying to be very fair and thinking how it will be in, 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 you know, how it will be understood in different cultures. But I think more of it is just practice, just writing, having a notebook, writing your impressions, and it's just a craft that you develop through use, yeah. What did your parents do? Um, so my mother taught English as a foreign language, so she had a huge um, food influence on me. Mm -hmm. So um, she's a great cook and we always had lots of foreign friends in our home, so I had a very unusual <coughs> gastronomic upbringing. And my father was in sort of the first generation of IT people. There is a bit of anxiety I get when I go to a new Chinese restaurant because I feel like when you want the good food, you have to perform. You have to perform yourself. You're going to say, Lao Ban, I, I, I'm here to actually consume the correct food. But people who can't just you know, turn on some Changsha dialect, how would they actually get the good food from the restaurants? Well, so without the language or, yeah, I mean, I suppose that one of the best ways is to look at what other, what other people are eating. Um, but it is difficult. And even when I go to China and I order for a group, in good Mandarin, knowledgeably, and I know the names of the dishes, um, it so often happens that the waiter will say, if I'm with foreigners, he'll say, oh, they can't possibly eat that. So there's the sort of assumption that foreigners won't be able to handle certain foods. And I ha sometimes have to have an argument and just say, look, we will eat it. And we have gone around proving that we can eat sea cucumbers and stuff, you know, on many occasions. But I think, and it's quite understandable because I think a lot of foreigners have a habit of ordering something that they can't handle and then being rude and obnoxious and just complaining or they think that there's a, you know, there's a bone in the chicken so that's a problem. It's not a problem, it's meant to be like that. So I think that Chinese um, waiting staff, particularly in the West but also in China, are a little wary of upsetting foreigners and also they just want people to have a nice time. So you have to battle against that stereotype if you really want to eat the good food. But, um, but I, think thing, you know, I think things are changing, and I think, but I think just looking at what other people are eating is incredibly useful. And then also showing your appreciation when you do eat something unusual, because I have a, you know, I, I should imagine that all the restaurants where I've been with groups of foreigners eating unusual things with gusto, that afterwards they thought, well, you know, it is possible for foreigners to, to eat this sort of thing. What is it then that you can't eat? Put, put aside the illegal. Uh, but where you just say, like, no, I'm not going to have that. No, I will eat everything. You will eat everything. Well, I did in Yunnan, actually. Mm -hmm. I did eat some. There's a very special dish in one particular region, which is raw pork, like a sort of tata pork. Sheng pi, dali, sheng pi. And um, I ate that um, because I was, you know, local people rave about it and eat it all the time. And I was aware that there are health issues with eating raw pork, but I really wanted to try it. <coughs> and so I had it with some local friends. It was really delicious, but I had this terrible panic afterwards, and I kept, you know, and I probably wouldn't do that again. But I think it's a really hard thing. Like, I want to eat with people, and I want to be totally open-minded and non-judgmental. And, um, and then, yeah, so I suppose it's just 
the only things that will restrain me are possibly sort of health concerns like that and then also sort of ethical issues. But I have a real dilemma with hairy crabs. So this is one of the great delicacies of the Jiangnan region. And, oh, they are so, and, and one of the best ways to eat them is their drunken crabs, yeah. Yeah, and they're sort of pickled in rice wine and seasonings. And it's just like you just fly to heaven when you eat one. Um, and I've been eating these for years with great delight. And then a couple of years ago, or a few years ago, the Shanghai authorities, where they're a great delicacy, they banned raw drunken crabs. And um, so I started sort of looking at why this was, and it turns out that they can carry parasites, freshwater raw creatures. So now, you know, somebody offers me a raw hairy crab, what do I do? <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been fine so far, and, um, but I don't know that the sort of lust for eating them is so you great. You only but... live once. <laughs> yeah. Why aren't there more raw dishes in Chinese food overall? Well, I mean, historical prejudice. So in, you know, in ancient China, the Chinese defined themselves as people who ate cooked food and barbarians beyond the borders of the empire ate raw food. And so there is this idea that, um, a very ancient idea going back to the Book of Rites, Li Ji, one of the classic texts, that um, you know, civilization began when people learnt how to harness fire to cook their food and they left behind the era of eating, um, drinking blood and eating feathers and having all the diseases from raw food. So there is a, a sort of idea that, you know, I remember when um, I took a, a Hunanese friend out for dinner in London and she was served a rare pigeon breast. You know, her initial reaction was anxiety. Is this going to be a bit dangerous? So it's a sort of health concerns coupled with an ancient tradition of eating cooked food. I spent about three months in Dali last year, and I was offered a lot of raw pork, and yes. I never took it. Right. It's probably very sensible. <laughs> <laughs> it was very nice. It was like, I mean, it was a bit like a steak tartare. But you'll eat raw meat in the US or no? I would eat raw beef, sure. Yeah. Pork, I don't know. But I think like um, in, in Germany, I think it's, I don't know if it's a certain region, they have met, which is raw pork. But when you eat this, it's, um, there are all kinds of rules and regulations for the temperature at which it's kept and how it's served and so on. Whereas in Dali, I mean, it was very, very kind of easy. But the fact is that local people of this particular group eat it all the time. And I was, fast, I was always asking people if they had any problems. And most people said, oh, it's fine. You know, they check the pork, it's fine. So, um, when and where is China most effective as a street food country? And when isn't it? So I don't, I don't eat much street food when I'm in China. Why not? But I might say in Malaysia, uh, the restaurant food is so good, yeah. and I've never found the street food to be better, even though it can be very good. Whereas I say in Malaysia, I might find street food on average to be better than restaurant food. Is there anywhere in China where street food's the way to go? Oh, well, um, yeah, in the north, in, I went to Kaifeng, the old um, Song Dynasty northern capital, and they had, this is some years ago, but they had the most incredible night market with all kinds of food on, and that was just amazing and delicious. And then I've had good, I mean, I think the problem is that, um, you know, with China's modernization, there's been this big effort to clean up the streets, and they've, they've seen sort of street food as being old-fashioned and something undesirable. And so, like when I lived in Sichuan in the beginning, there were actually quite a lot of street traders doing really nice food, and it's harder to find them. But actually, in, so if you go to Chengdu, mm -hmm. go to the Wenshu Monastery, and in the streets around there, there are people serving some traditional snacks, Danhong Gao, these little pancakes stuffed with pork or sweet things. Um, yeah, um, Tang Yu Guo Zi. Yeah. yeah, these um, lovely. So I would go there. There are certain areas where it's tolerated and where you can have really lovely street food, yeah. Dan, do you have a view on this? Uh, basically anywhere with a night market, I think, is reliably the places with great street food, um, and especially these nice little barbecues and noodles. Um, I echo uh, Fuxia here that Shanghai, I believe, used to have actually quite a nice street food uh, life, and then they cleaned all of that up, and I think they've maybe have been borderline successful in driving that out. I know, and sometimes what they do is they they bring street food into an area, a bit like the Singaporean Hawker Center idea, but the problem is that they're not individual traders anymore, they're just people working for someone else, and it's not really, not really the kind of really good street food. Lydia, what do we have here? 
Uh, I think we missed our uh, seafood pro with sticky rice. Right. And that's a dish that everyone took one and it's now gone. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a very typical Hubei cuisine. Um, we like to use pork as a filling, but for today's um, variety, that switched to crab and seafood. Um, and coat it with sticky rice, steamed, and just uh, finishing up with a beautiful glaze. And next we have the famous squirrel fish. Um, today, I think they are more daisy looking. <laughs> and <laughs> sometimes amazing knife work. knife work. Look at that. Yes, it is. You know, cut like that, and they're not falling apart. They're all staying in these lovely fronds. That's right. Try something. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Uh, no episode of uh, conversations with Tyler would be complete without a. Uh, <laughs> implication or understanding that uh, everything comes back to economics. What can, it, what can an economist learn from eating more Chinese food? You're asking me. Either, anybody. I, would, I, I have no idea. I'm not an economist. <laughs> a, competition works. B, Adam Smith said division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. So as Chinese became the number one group coming to the United States, you started getting a lot of regional cuisine. But also look for places that are not too easy to get to, not frequented by too many tourists, and have grumpy uh, diners and abusive staff. Because there's a selection effect. If the place is in business at all and it's full, that's implying the food is very good. It's being patronized often by elderly Chinese, who in my view are much fussier than a lot of younger Chinese. Younger Chinese in this country, sort of by my standards, are too willing to go out to eat to enjoy themselves. And I just think that's wrong. Uh, those would be my starting points, but other answers are welcome. Um, trade promotes globalization. Uh, Sichuan food is uh, slightly easier to export, as Fuchsia said, given the chilies and the peppercorns. That's why it's really easy to have that standardized across the world. When, when Fuchsia mentioned that the, the willingness for the government to try to standardize cuisine didn't really work, you kind of see this ability of the individual to kind of design the menu themselves. It's a very big aspect as you know big economic concept there. It's like a different question for Fuchsia. Um, I'm wondering, you, you write in your book about how the, the West, I guess the Anglosphere in particular, had this experience with Chinese food coming in, I guess in the post-war period when um, essentially what they ended up, what you end up getting in a takeaway is not real kind of proper Chinese food. Um, so I guess, do you have a sense of other regions, other continents of the world, have they had a similar experience with Chinese food coming there, or maybe some of you haven't even had it yet? Oh, well, I mean, I think, yes, I think that the sort of Cantonese simplified model is in many places, but with slight variation. So like in Sweden, they have something called Four Little Dishes, which is like a standard menu of Chinese takeaway food. Um, yeah, and I think that it seems to have been a, a blueprint that worked very well all over the place. Um, yeah, with a sweet tastes and fried foods, and with, with, with variations. But I have to say, I mean, I haven't traveled to Peru, for example, where they have, I, by all accounts, a very interesting, yeah, local Chinese food. And also Calcutta has some very interesting old Chinese dishes, and I have yet to go there, so. Both of those are very good, but they're very different. Yes. They don't feel to me like white Chinese food, but I would recommend them, Chifa's which you even can get in Northern Virginia, though it's much better in Peru. Oh, really? But okay. they're like rice dishes with Chinese elements in them, is mm. the way I would think about them. I spent some time in Barcelona uh, this summer, and I found, uh, first of all, Barcelona to be, I think, the, um, my favorite city for food in Europe, in part because I think it has um, a very great respect for Asian cuisine. This was the first European country I've seen where there were a lot of Spanish chefs making Chinese food, Spanish chefs making Japanese food, um, and I thought that it was um, um, quite good. Where, where is the best city in Europe for Chinese food? Is it London? I mean, I haven't done a survey, so I have no idea. But, um, yeah. But I, if I somewhere were great, you would have been pulled to it, right? Well, I hope so. But, I mean, I'm yeah. spoiled because I eat a lot in China, so, you know, I don't feel the need to go and eat Chinese food everywhere else. I feel like Singapore has really good Chinese food because of the Chinese population. Um, like, yeah, London has great Chinese food, not just, um, you know, the Chinatown that has been there for maybe uh, decades, but also the newer, where I like to call it modern Chinese. Uh, we talk about um, Chef Wang, Andy Wang, 
uh, yeah, really doing an excellent um, idea with elevated Chinese foods um, being tasting menu. But I think one problem, and this uh, maybe comes back to economics again, that in England, for example, I think now the door has opened to massive public interest in regional Chinese food, and people are really, you know, open to trying now eating Sichuan, Xi'an food, and so on. But the real problem is that we have very stringent um, immigration rules. So in order for uh, you know, a chef to come over and work in a restaurant in London, they have to have a certain level of English and a certain income, which is prohibitive for anyone but the big international hotels. And I think it's a shame that we don't have more trained chefs coming in um, from China to bring different aspects of Chinese food. I find that the Chinese food in Madrid is actually even better than Barcelona. You spend much time in Madrid for no. Chinese? I think because even there you get very very obscure local cuisine from China is also in Madrid, where in Barcelona it's not as, uh, you know, you can't get the obscurities as much. This book, other books you've written, what's the hardest thing for you about writing a book? Um, well, I found this a lot harder than writing a cookbook. Why? Um, because a cookbook has a slightly obvious structure. So unless you're going to do something really radical, you have a sort of introduction, you know, you can go into basic techniques and ingredients, then you have recipes often grouped by ingredient, and each recipe has a head note. So the structure, by now I've done a few cookbooks, is, is fairly straightforward. Um, with a narrative book, it can be anything you want. <laughs> so I, you know, I start with a vague idea that I want to talk about some of the great themes of Chinese gastronomy mm -hmm. and cuisine. And then it's sort of how to organize it. It's a bit frightening because I felt that I was starting with much more of a blank page than with a cookbook. Yeah. What's your most unusual, successful work habit? Um, getting on a train. And what do you do then? <laughs> no, if you I mean have... Th through China? Or just anywhere. you got on a British train and you write? If or I you can't... got on a British train and you cook? <laughs> <laughs> if I have a, blo a writing block and I just, I'm frustrated and I feel I can't possibly do it and I just give up, if I get moving and get on a train, <laughs> then for some reason my mind starts loosening up and I have a breakthrough. <laughs> um, also sitting in cafes, but just change of scene. So moving and not moving are your no, no, being somewhere, habits. getting away from yeah. being the solitary writer at your computer or at your desk, and sort of that breaks the deadlock. But I have, I have to say, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put myself up as a model of eff effective um, and you know, <laughs> efficient working. But well, I want to say, you finished your book on time. I remember meeting you last year in London. You said you were writing this book, and you have a very um, strict deadline. And look at well, where we are. Well, I did have the, the, the advantage of the global pandemic, which meant that I wasn't <laughs> racing around the world, but I had to stay home. <laughs> Other than China, now that it's quite easy to travel. Where else do you want to go for food? I'd like to go back to Japan. You know, people sometimes think I know about Asian food and I really don't because I've been so concentrated on China. And I went to Japan for the first time in 2018. And um, I have only dipped my little finger into that particular pie. And so I would love to go. And it's so interesting because obviously it relates to Chinese food and you see some words and processes and things that have died out in China that are still in Japan expressed differently. So it's kind of related, but fascinatingly different for me. I was there a few weeks ago. I had one Chinese meal for breakfast. It was quite good. Just uh, amazing sushi anywhere without even looking for it. Yes. Uh, some people would say that Japan now has the best French cooking, some of the best Italian cooking. <laughs> now I'm skeptical that they can have the best Chinese cooking, but what do you think? I don't think they do. I've been to Michelin-starred yeah. Chinese restaurants in Tokyo. They're very good. They deserve their stars. But I think, say, compared to Chengdu or somewhere, they'd only be middling quality among the good restaurants. Is it because there's no grumpy diners? <laughs> <laughs> They're cooking for Michelin diners who do have good taste, but it's a little rarefied. And at the visceral level, there's just something a bit missing, I found. But it seems so. This is a very superficial impression because I wasn't there for very long. But it seemed to me that Japan also has the old school Chinatown cooking and newer cooking. Yokohama and in particular, that, yeah. Yeah, but, um, but one meal that I wrote about in this book, a Chinese meal, was actually cooked, mm. the, the stir-fry chapter. Um, I went to one small Chinese modern restaurant where the Chinese technique and the sort of sensibility and aesthetics were very Chinese, um, and it was absolutely superb. 
Yeah, so that, that, that was just a little snapshot, but um, it was very interesting. Um, yeah, Chinese yeah. food cooked in at a, and served at a sort of bar like a sushi counter, actually. Lydia, where do you think you're going to? For food, obviously, there's maybe other reasons to travel. Oh maybe my not. God. <laughs> uh, well, I'm dying to go to Peru um, for the food, but also for the nature thing, uh, Machu Picchu. Um, and I want to say, I haven't really explored much of Mexico. I feel like it's so close to home where we live, but it's underrated. I was only in Mexico City the first time this August with my uh, then nine month year daughter. We explored the city from pastries in the morning, great coffee shops, to um, we haven't really had a lot of opportunity to explore the street tacos, but the dining scene, the restaurants are truly amazing with boat flavors. Yeah, then um, I would say uh, Southeast Asia for me. Um, I guess maybe more the street food um, that I find um, quite thrilling. I've had quite a lot of refined Chinese food. Now it's more, um, it's, a, it's a street food uh, now for me. And I have not spent uh, Mexico at all. And I think that Mexico is um, hugely exciting. Rural Mexico in particular is one of my all time favorites. For mm -hmm. me, it's on a par with China. I love Mexico City. It's incredible. But just side of the road dishes in small towns or on the edge of mid-sized towns, for me, that's the best food in Mexico. And I will do that in life until I can't do it anymore. And I've been to Mexico over 30 times. And just every meal is a wonder in the way that it is in China and can be in India, but not too many other places. I love Japan, but Japan also has a lot of the worst food. Now, I don't go there to eat it, but it can be disgusting, or the desserts, or uh, I think Japan has a very high variance of food, even though all of it is well done by its standards. So sometimes I think they are pursuing the wrong standards. What explains that variation? They pursue perfection and, in, in a way, achieve it. But if you don't agree with all matters of taste, pursuing perfection, in a sense, can be a negative. So if you look at these Filipino desserts, which for me are too sweet, they're too gooey, they're too large, too many different things piled on top of each other, but they're quite popular. There are people who love them, and I don't think they're wrong to love them. Uh, Japan just takes every direction you can imagine and perfects it, and that's a little dangerous. And I won't eat raw chicken in Japan, speaking of things you know, that I don't eat. To me, I'm, I don't know that I'm afraid. I, I trust that it's safe. I just think it would disgust me, and that's irrational. But. There I am, and what, what else I can get is so good. Nominations from this side of the room. I've only been to China once, so I think I'd love to go back. Um, I was in Chongqing, um, I think, I mean, for all the reasons you just mentioned, like there's, I think, an endless amount of things to sort of um, discover and, and kind of seems to mine there. Well, I've never been to China, so. That's the obvious answer. <laughs> I think Ethiopia is still very underrated when it comes to food. I've only been there for the first time this year, and it was it blew me away. So I want to go back for sure and try a lot more Ethiopian dishes. What struck you in particular? The spice combinations. That was the quick, the quick, quick answer. Um, it, it's, some of the combos are so odd I can't describe them properly. And it's, like, it's it, it, the only closest thing it kind of reminds me of is like some of, some Peruvian spices, for example strange in itself, right, Mexican spices. But that combination of spices, um, it's, uh, these need a lot more exploration, I think. Lydia, what do we have here? We have a peach tree sap. Speaking of, um, Chinese is not huge on dessert. Sometimes, you know, after a full meal of banquet, we just eat some seasonal fruit. Um, it will be a lot of like um, specialty cutting into like um, cute shapes of watermelon or um, uh, apples, pears, dragon fruits. But today we're having a little tree sap. This is also a modern Chinese dessert. Future can talk a lot more about it. <laughs> it's funny because I never saw so this ingredient, ingredient peach tree sap. I never saw it until the last five years yeah. or something, and suddenly it's become incredibly trendy. And it's often served in sort of fairy tale soups with things like silver ear mushrooms and lotus seeds, goji berries, and, um, and other of these lovely texture foods, right? Mm -hmm. And it is from a peach tree. Yes. And how do you source it? Is it a peach tree sap business? Yeah. <laughs> you get it dried and it looks like little pieces of knobbly amber. 
and you soak them yeah. and then they sort of swell up into this lovely jelly. Mm. We are at about the end of our podcast. I would just like to thank everyone for participating. Uh, thank Lydia Chang, her father Peter, the entire staff at Mama Chang. They always treat me wonderfully. I just love them. Uh, I actually don't want them to be surly to me. They're, they're super <laughs> nice. Uh, Fuchsia, of course, has done the book and made this all possible. Again, that's Invitation to a Banquet, the story of Chinese food. Uh, please do buy it, read it, and I would stress buy all of her books. Uh, you cannot buy just one. And uh, Fuchsia, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much for your support of Conversations with Tyler. For me, I feel it's the most important thing to do, teaching people the art of appreciating humanity and appreciating talent. If you would be in a position to support us in any way possible, please let us know. Send us your contributions. We plan to continue producing Conversations with Tyler, but we're only able to do this because of the support of individuals such as yourself. <laughs>